Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for your audio main event. Weighing in on all things pro wrestling, your hosts, Sheldon Goldberg and Mike Johnson. And now, PWInsider.com presents PW Insider Radio. Welcome, everyone, to another edition of PW Insider Radio. Sheldon Goldberg here along with Mike Johnson. And, Mike, as they say in baseball, it's been a long time between innings. Yeah, way too long. But uh, it, it, with WrestleMania season coming and uh, a major project you had working on, which we'll talk about in a second, and also just uh, my schedule with the site, we could not get in the same place at the same time. But going forward, we're going to start doing these a lot more often. So those of you who are listening – uh, via iTunes or checking it out via our YouTube channel at PW Insider TV, or for those of you who are just checking it out via PWInsider.com, uh, you'll get an idea of what's going on in the PW Insider Elite section and get some great discussion about pro wrestling and everything around that unique universe. So, hi, and, and, you know, how are you? It, it, I'm, I'm great, and i got to tell you, you know, uh, if, for those of you who are not subscribers to PW Insider, I mean, the reason it's been so long between these is all the hard work that Mike and company do on that site. There's a ton, and I do mean a ton, of great content up there. We're going to preview some of that a little bit later in, in this uh, program, but uh, uh, it, it's been a real busy time for me, of course, as you know, in New England Championship Wrestling. My company up here in the Boston area is uh, has been on television since April 4th, and uh, doing weekly television is... Uh, Time-consuming, but extremely rewarding. Very, very grateful to uh, be back on television and very, very grateful to have had this opportunity to uh, uh, reach a broadcast audience with the, this company. And so far, so good. It's, uh, I've been very, very happy with uh, uh, the shows themselves. Not that there isn't room for improvement, but uh, very happy with what we've been doing and uh, very happy with response to the shows, too. It's been uh, very, very gratifying. So... Uh, I want to thank everybody that has written to me and uh, everybody that has uh, taken time to message me and uh, give me their support and their feedback. It's very, very much appreciated. Well, we're definitely going to talk a little bit about NECW and their storylines later on in the show, but let's talk about WWE. Uh, you know, in the last week or two, there's been a huge turnaround in the in the product. Mm. Uh, the the, the storylines have gotten a little more uh, deeper than they had been in recent months. You know, obviously with the TV PG product, they've been kind of leaning towards the younger crowd, but there's been some some, some deeper, more interesting storylines of late with the addition of characters like The Shield, Zeb Coulter, and at the Payback pay-per-view, we had the double turn with Dolph Ziggler and Alberto Del Rio, mm. and uh, playing off of the Ziggler concussion that had him out for so many weeks, we had the return of CM Punk, uh, on the next day on Raw, we had the return of Mark Henry, we had the return of Christian, um, and a lot of old school pro wrestling where guys are getting angry at each other over personal issues. Paul Heyman kind of gets the kiss off from CM Punk, Paul Heyman's buddy Brock Lesnar shows up and lays out CM Punk. That's an old school angle if you've ever heard of one. Right, exactly. Alberto Del Rio winning the world title. Dolph Ziggler angry and Chase attacking him from the crowd because Ziggler was wrongly beaten down and Alberto Del Rio took advantage of Ziggler's concussion. And, you know, that's a classic babyface chasing the heel champion sort of scenario there. Mm. Um, and, And in the middle of it all, we've got the puppet masters all back on television. Vince and Stephanie and Hunter all fighting amongst themselves like the good old days of Vince, Shane, Stephanie, and Linda. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And who knows how far they're going to go, and the wind always changes. Right. Or I should say, WWE always changes direction the way the wind blows, because mm-hmm. it's all based on Vince McMahon's whim. But the, the, the more recent programming that they've presented on Raw and SmackDown and uh, the pay-per-view payback has been really a breath of fresh air with a lot of fans very excited and I think a lot more intrigued by the product than they've had in quite some time. A quick question. what is there any one particular factor that you think has spurred these changes and any particular uh, 
incident or any particular set of incidents that have caused them to up the game, so to speak? I don't know if it's the if it's the consistent or I should say the constant changing of the guard with the creative team, but uh, you know, one person told me uh, several months ago, and we we talked about this in, in the elite section that CM Punk pretty much went to Vince, um, and this was before WrestleMania, and said the product sucks. You're not reaching the fans. You're not going to make anyone care about the way it's presented. And who knows whether that was a cause and effect or whether the influx of old school guys like Paul Heyman and Dutch Mantel coming into the company, maybe they're being able to get their voices heard a little bit more. Or maybe it's just, you know, the guy who is the guy, the current creative team just kind of hit on something and Vince bit and said, let's go. What I think has been a big catalyst for the improvement of the shows has been the push of Daniel Bryan and Kane and Randy Orton against the Shield. Because every week, there's some combination of those three heroes working against some combination of those three villains. All of them are good to great workers. Kane and mm. Roman Reigns, obviously, a lot more uh, power-based in, in comparison to the more of the technical finesse of the other guys. Mm-hmm. But there's been, you know, when, when there's chemistry and a good spark in terms of uh, the way guys interact and the way guys compete in the ring, you cannot produce that. It just has to happen. And I think they've really hit on something. And that, in a lot of ways, has kind of been the glue that's held these shows together beyond the silliness of a John Cena, Ryback feud that really didn't connect with anybody or some silly promos or some bad backstage uh, toilet humor. To me, it seems like these guys have really been carrying the ball for the company and have you know, created a situation where the fans are buying them because they're great wrestlers. Mm, mm, which is as it should be. An- another question, and, and maybe you don't have an answer for this. How much influence does Triple H have over the product? Has his level of influence changed? And, and is this a harbinger of more this, this, of this more wrestling-based product, uh, something that would uh, indicate his increased influence over what we're seeing? Um, obviously, you know, he's getting further and further ingratiated into it, which, and we'll talk about the WWE developmental system in a little bit. I know it's one of the things I wanted to get into with the creation of the performance center that's going to debut in July. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, he was the one that made the call to stop the Daniel Bryan match with Randy Orton this past Monday on Raw. Mm. Um, he is, he's the one that is negotiating talent contracts. He's the one that signed Jericho to the deal that Jericho had when he came back. He's the one that negotiated the deal with Rob Van Dam, which and we'll hear a clip of Rob talking about his relationship with Triple H later on. Mm. Um, they, you know, He's getting a lot more ingratiated and ingrained in running things. And I don't think it's Vince you know, preparing or, or Vince not being involved because Vince is still managing all the minutia. But I think it's Vince kind of coaxing him along and, and and getting him ready for the one day when, you know, the inevitable always happens. Father time wins in the end where Vince is not there or not able to go and, and be the guy in charge. And Triple H is going to be the new point person. And mm. I think he's a lot more in, involved now than people even realize. And I'm sure only people that really work full time in that tower really have an idea of how much is Triple H's vision and how much is Vince's. Mm. But, you know, Triple H is a guy who grew up being the world's biggest Ric Flair fan. He grew right. up on the NWA. I mean, you know, he was trained by Kowalski up near you in, Lo- in New right. England. Mm-hmm. He's an old school pro wrestling fan. So I would think his voice is going to have some of that DNA in it when he's pushing his ideas, as opposed to, you know, say Stephanie, who was brought up in, you know, under the, you know, as the sports entertainment princess, and right. that's the way that things should be presented. So that's going to be interesting, you know, when they finally take over. What happens when those two worlds kind of start butting heads and they have different visions on how things should be presented? Indeed, indeed. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens as time goes on, because you're right, Father Time always wins in the end. and uh, uh, Changes are, are certain to take place, but what those changes are going to be and... Uh, uh, how they're going to come about is yet to be determined. But for right now, I think people should just uh, just enjoy what they're seeing and you know uh, enjoy, as you put it, this breath of fresh air. So, I think you know there's more. Ta- 
talent out there, and there's there's a greater presentation of good to great matches now in WWE television, especially when you factor in NXT, main event, superstars, than we've ever gotten in the past from WWE. Um, there, there, there's more of a a focus on having good longer back and forth wrestling matches and competitive athletic wrestling matches than we ever saw at any previous time in, in the company history. Mm. Like, even, you know, people always talk about Bret Hart was a great worker. Sean was a great performer. Uh, this guy was a great WWF was traditionally the punch and kick promotion. Everything exactly was exactly right. Around, yeah. Everything was built around power and behemoths and, and punching and kicking even back to the days of Bruno San Martino and Ivan Koloff and all those guys. It was never about, you know, arm drags and hip tosses. It was about, you know, the baby face getting beaten down and making the big comeback and finally clamping on his finisher and blood and guts and all that. It was very much, you know, built around the idea of the superhuman hero making the comeback. Right. That was, the, that was always the emphasis back in the day in the, in the World Wide Wrestling Federation. That was the emphasis. And the so-called scientific matches were always relegated to the undercard. Yeah, and, and you would see them now and then, but they were definitely not the emphasis. Yeah, and so you, you look at it now, and obviously everything comes full circle, and trends right. change, and fads change over time. But what we see now is that there's more of a focus on having great wrestling in the middle of the card. Like, I watched that Payback pay-per-view, and uh, I talked about this in the, in the PW Insider Elite section in the post-game show that Mike Epson Hart and I recorded. Mm -hmm. That felt like a WCW card to me. Because yeah. WCW, when Kevin Sullivan was booking WCW during the, the hot period in the Monday Nitro era, his his thought process, and you know, he and I have discussed this in the past when I've interviewed Kevin, mm -hmm. was always great wrestling underneath, and the closer you got to the top, the the more wilder you got with your gimmicks and your personalities. Mm -hmm. And you look at that payback pay per view, and it's four or five really good matches, mm -hmm. and then the main event is John Cena and Ryback doing. Let's beat each other up around the ambulance and rip fenders off and use weapons and break glass windows and things like that. So you have your spectacle and your big brawl. And underneath you had your your Daniel Bryan and Randy Orton against the Shield. You had your CM Punk, Chris Jericho classic. You right. had AJ and Caitlin having the best Divas match that we've seen all year mm. uh, from WWE. And you know, it, it was a and Ziggler versus Alberto was a, was a good solid match, and so you had all this good wrestling, and then on top you had your spectacle, which is that you know. So whether it was meant to or not, it kind of harkened back to the way WCW would uh, present themselves. Right. It was right. interesting, so. and, and I mean, I with all the returns and with all of the potential talents that could come up from NXT, which we could talk about that in a little bit. Right. I have a stronger conviction in terms of my belief that in the end, maybe it's going to be okay. Because my fear over the, over the years as I've written and discussed this industry and this company is that they're going to hit that point where they hit the cliff and they got nothing to follow with after yeah. Undertaker's gone and Sean is retired and right. Cena's going to get beat up and one day he's going to have to retire. Mm -hmm. And all of these great workers who were there have been cycled into agents and they're not in the ring teaching the next generation because they physically can't, and they're older. And I've always been worried that they're going to hit a point where they, they're churning out all these uh, cookie-cutter bodybuilder types from NXT who look all nice and pretty, and they can, they can do some stuff in the ring, but there was a, a distinct difference between the pro wrestler of the previous generation and the sports entertainer who knows nothing about wrestling and just came through the WWE uh, programming. And to me, that always worried me because the latter always felt like they were doing one, two, three, jump, one, two, three, jump, and they were hitting their spots. They weren't putting wrestling matches together. Right. You can always tell when the pro wrestlers are, are, are putting wrestling together because mm. it was always, you know, play to the crowd and play to the flow of the match. And you can always see the distinct differences. And I feel like now, because they've grabbed so many guys from the independents, whether it's a Daniel Bryan or a Dean Ambrose or Seth Rollins or whoever, right. and they, those guys are the, you know, they're pretty much the closest equivalent to the Eddie Guerrero, Chris Benoit, Dean Malenko, Chris Jericho types from the previous generation. Those guys are going to start bleeding over into the sports entertainment guys. And, you know, between that, the returns uh, and the great performances of Christian, who had a great match with Wade Barrett first night back in, Mark Henry, who had a career moment uh, with the John Cena 
false retirement angle. Yeah. And guys that they've got down in developmental now, like Sami Zayn, the former El Generico, and right. Cassius Ono, the former Chris Hero, who are great workers who now they're you know they're they're finding their niche and finding their WWE characters and nuances that when they come up, they'll be ready made and we'll have some guys with experience and it won't just feel like a one dimensional product. But I really, I really have a lot more faith in, in at least their short-term future than I did even a month ago. I'll tell you what. Let's take a break right here. We're going to hear a little bit of an interview that uh, took place recently with uh, Rob Van Dam. And on the other side of that, when we come back, let's have a little bit of a, a more in-depth discussion about WWE developmental and NXT. How's that? Sounds good. So, All right. Here's, here's Rob Van Dam talking about whether he would return to WWE, as obviously he's about to, and whether his relationship in the past with Triple H would have any effect on that. When you look back on the uh, the TNA run, how do you compare it to the WWE and ECW in terms of uh, personal satisfaction? Um, you know, it, it was a, it, it's all business, and it's all business deal. I've never regretted one business decision that I've ever made in pro wrestling. So when that happens then maybe I'll know that I'm at the other end of my career. But back in 1990, maybe it was 91, I think it was 90, uh, just, you know, we were just starting out. We did like about five weeks or so with USWA, the last remaining territory. And after a few weeks, you know, we went home because we had a few days off. And when we went to go back on the road, uh, we talked to them on the phone, and they said, hey, you know, we really don't have anything else for you. They finished us up. And, I mean, I was, like, I wasn't even old enough to drink. I was 19 or 20, just a green little kid. Besides that, it's always been my decision to leave. I've always known what was best for my career. Uh, I, I've left WWE twice. Uh, I've left uh, ECW. I left all of Japan. Everywhere was me saying, okay, it's time for me to make this move. I've never regretted it one time looking back. So, uh, the fans, they can always be like, oh, what are you doing? You're burning, you're, you're burying yourself, whatever. They, they're not, they don't know. They're not on the, on the end as far as the knowledge, uh, how good I'm being taken care of, what my business deal is, or any of that. Uh, when it comes to, on, 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 on the program, um, you know, as far as like, uh, being utilized properly, uh, I mean, I, I can't say that, that I feel like uh, anybody other than Paul Heyman has ever tried to utilize me to make their company grow and to make money and do business off of me. I've never felt anybody else do that except for Paul Heyman. Why do you, why do you, why do you think um, nobody else has tried to use you as an asset in the same vein that Paul did? I assume it's mostly because I'm a nonconformist. You know what I mean? Uh, back in the day in uh, WWE, I remember when Bruce Pritchard came up to me one time and he says, uh, Rob, um, you know, John Cena's going to be taking off pretty soon to go do this movie, The Marine. I said, okay. He said, well, there's going to be an opening there. I said, okay. He goes, well, I think this is your big chance. I'm like, okay, well, book me in the main event. What do you, what do you tell me? He goes, well, no, but it takes more than that. I go, wait, wait, wait. I need to step it up to take Cena's place. This kid was in the wrestling school like three years ago, man. I went, I went, and I, I was, I trained him one day. What are you talking about? He's like, no, but it's more than that. You need, you need to develop a relationship with Vince. You need to bond with him. You need to go to him and say, Vince, I'm your man. I'm going to be your champion. He needs to know that he can believe in you. And I got to tell you, if I knew for sure that if I went up and said these words, it was going to equate to a million, two million dollar check or something, I could do it. But for you to tell me that I need to learn how to go down that path and, 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 and operate my career in such a way, I can't do it. That's not me. I'd have to be someone else. So I've always felt like I was limited. Uh, they always tried to change me all throughout my career. And I've always felt like promoters really don't know what to do with me. They, they know the fans love me. They, they, they feel that. Uh, so they, they understand I have some value, but because I'm not the cookie cutter wrestler that'll scream at the camera and say, I'm gonna rip your head off! 
off and spit on your neck. They want that, and they've always been confused by the fact that I could be so laid back, but still uh, be so physical. And, and because that's one of the things that makes me many makes me different. Uh, one of the many things that makes me different. I've always felt like I, I will have a glass ceiling. I am limited with how far I'll get, and that's okay. I've always felt like I'll get as far as I can get uh, without without falling short of my own standards. And uh, and there you go. I'll call it a good career. <laughs> you know, a lot of people assume that because Triple H has taken a, a greater role in WWE, that that might limit your interest in going back there. Um, you know, what's the story? Is there issues between you and him? Did you guys butt heads at some point? Because there's always this, you know, the talk of, oh, Triple H buried this guy. He buried that guy. And they've said that about you. They've said that about Booker. And a lot, and a million other people. So, like, we're you know, when you look at when you look at him being more involved in the management end of WWE, does that kind of color your interest in going back there on a full time basis or even on a part time basis? I find that if you listen to like minded people, you'll get uh, some commonalities with the information that you get. When I first started hanging out with Bret Hart, I thought he was so cool. I didn't know him really well because he was like a generation above me. I used to watch him, but I thought he was cool. And hanging out with him, I thought, you know what, we have like a similar vibration. We could totally be friends. And come to find out, when we talked about the dressing room, we both like all the same guys. We both don't like all the same guys. There's a reason for that. If you hear over and over about a certain person being a dick, there might be some truth to it. And I'm not saying, you know, uh, that you shouldn't judge somebody uh, by by your own experiences. But I am saying, you know, when it comes to that, when you're trying to get inside information, um, there, there's a lot. There's a lot to it, especially. I consider myself genuine. It's one of the best compliments I get from people when they say, dude, you're a real dude, man. Um, yeah, other people that are genuine, I get along with great. Other people that are, that are that I find um, disingenuous, I'm just simply not going to be uh, real compatible with them. I could do business with them. They're not going to be uh, uh, sitting on my living room couch watching TV at my house. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's everybody. I mean, you know, people are people and you, you choose, uh, who you hang out with and who you don't and, and whatever. But, um, definitely a lot has changed since I've been up there before. Um, business is business and there, and that's in the wrestling business. There are no, there are no burnt bridges. I heard a long time ago, I think it was Jerry Lynn that told me that, uh, bridges are flame retardant in the wrestling business. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and that's true. And I, you know, and I, I certainly uh, don't have any reason or any animosity uh, to keep me from doing business with anybody. And I also am not one to harbor hate. You know, I mean, that's like something that I, I just don't throw out there. You know what I mean? And uh, when people, I'm not some joker. So, oh, I hate it when people do this. But you know, people that really, really hold on to, I can't stand. You know, I mean, that really only brings your own vibration down to to harbor such negative energy. So I I consciously uh, make an effort to to remove that through my life on a daily basis. But but um, you know, uh, if that doesn't answer your question, you know, I'm I'm saying you know, there's there's um, there's nothing. Uh, there's nothing uh, anywhere in the wrestling business that I can think of. Uh... You're listening to PW Insider Radio. Welcome back to PW Insider Radio. Sheldon Goldberg and Mike Johnson. And Mike, when we uh, uh, left our conversation off, we were just about to start talking about WWE Developmental and NXT. Big changes taking place in Developmental. Yes, as of uh, July 8th, they're going to open up the WWE Performance Center in Winter Park, Florida. This is the continuation of their relationship with Full Sail University, where NXT is now filmed. And uh, all of the developmental talents, as well as, a, as well as a lot of new talents who have been signed in recent weeks, will be heading to Orlando. The idea here is to kind of create the state-of-the-art uh, equivalent for pro wrestling of like an Olympic training center where they're going to have like seven rings in there and all sorts of sports medicine uh, professionals. And they're going to be able to not just train 
uh, guys from outside the business to become great wrestlers, but take independent guys and help change them around and, and help them improve to become WWE performers, but also in working in conjunction with Full Sail, have the ability to tap into the Full Sail, which is a, a like a an entertainment and media college, to train future members of the WWE production, WWE creative, WWE marketing teams that can eventually work there, cut their teeth, and be hired to go work for the company. So they really are building uh, their own little Garden of Eden to kind of find uh, apples to pick from forever. So mm. it's interesting. And in the past, developmental has always been, hey, let's put send a bunch of guys to Louisville and we'll have Danny Davis babysit them and train them. Or we'll send them here, we'll send them there. And FCW, which later became NXT, was a lot closer to the current vision of what they wanted in terms of having a place where everybody trains under one roof, but WWE did not own uh, FCW. WWE um, was not as inter as as strong in terms of the uh, the day to day management. And of course, Tri Triple H came in and he's he's involved in overseeing all of it. And Bill Demott is there running the day to day, and uh, it's going to be a lot very interesting because when you watch their TV. It's the closest thing to the 21st century equivalent of the old Jim Crockett product at Techwood Drive back in the day. Right. It's right. very much a studio wrestling show, except, you know, the, the interviews are not right after the matches. They're kind of backstage. Mm -hmm. And there's some, there's some WWE style vignettes, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's all about the wrestling. And, you know, you get the most wrestling for your dollar, as my father used to say about what, why, why he liked the NWA versus the WWF. You right. got more in-ring wrestling for your time and for your investment. And NXT, you know, w without except without although the the most recent episode of Raw will probably be the exception to the rule, but usually with NXT, it is the best wrestling show that anybody puts on every week. With no disrespect to NECW, I mean of the nationally the nationally uh, produced shows, and uh, it's you know it, it really feels like there's a breath of fresh air with a lot of really young fresh characters and guys really working hard to to better themselves and you know now. They're signing a bunch of new guys to come in to the Florida to come to the Winter Park territory, and it, it you know I'm very curious to see what the future holds because they got a lot of really good raw talent coming in, and uh, you know Triple H and Bill Demott and Billy Gunn and the other guys that are going to be heading it up, they know what they want, and they've been planning this for well over a year. Let, let's expand on that point about who this talent is. In case you're not watching NXT, uh, or maybe if you watch it every now and then, who, who, in your opinion, should we be looking at? Well, Bray Wyatt of the Wyatt family, he's and, and the Wyatt family, those are the guys who have been kind of the creepy guys in the woods that have been popping up in WWE television of late. Right. And Bray Wyatt is one of the sons of Mike Rotunda. Mm -hmm. uh, he popped up in WWE a while back as Husky Harris, and then was sent down right. to developmental to be retooled. And he's kind of like the sort of Jim Jones... Uh, cult leader sort of uh like like a sleazy southern like almost like the texas chainsaw massacre meets jim jones like that that sort of d delusional uh insane family and he's he's got uh, a couple of guys with him um luke harper who of course was Brody lee and chikara and uh two cw in north in new york and also worked for dragon gate in japan and uh uh uh, I forgot Rowan's last name at the moment. This is what happens when you're recording live radio. Um, there's another guy named Rowan who uh, is also a big monster. And those guys are about to come up to the main roster. And they, there's just a great chemistry between them. And uh, Harper especially works, even though he's a larger guy, he, he, he bumps and he works like a cruiserweight. So mm. he, he, you know, he's the perfect guy to like be the base that these sm sort of smaller, flashier talents can work with. Um, Sami Zayn, who was the former El Generico, now unmasked, and he's showing a lot of charisma that we never got to see because he was under the mask. Mm. And what's interesting about him is he speaks five different languages. So that allows him to kind of um, reach out and touch upon all these different cultures. And they, they're looking at him as being a guy that they can feed to their international audiences and licensees as a, a, a new star that can connect with audiences in different areas. Um, Cass, and he's just a great worker, and now he's kind of getting the WWE style down and slowing down, you know, and not doing as much crazy stuff as he would do when he was in, like, a Ring of Honor or a Pro Wrestling Gorilla. Um, Cassius Ono was the former Chris Hero 
And he, you know, I always liken him to like a very young Barry Windham. Right. And, uh, you know, he works very hard. And, you know, he's a guy that he's cut promos in the past, but he's never had to do TV. So I think, you know, in the ring, he's obviously there, but they're allowing him now and, and kind of coaching him along to work and play towards or towards a TV audience and mm. to the cameras and do the backstage vignettes. And um, the other guy who's uh, very interesting to follow is Corey Graves, who if you look at him, he looks like almost like you took Vanilla Ice, CM Punk and Jeff Hardy and threw them in a blender. He's got all of his tattoos where, you know, and he talks about these in promos where, you know, his tattoos are his suit of armor to protect him from the world. Okay. And he's got the filth brigade, which is what he calls his fans. And he's kind of got this sort of sleazy arrogance to him, but he's a baby face. So it's, it's mm. almost like, you know, the CM Punk character where you look at him and you go, right. that guy's just a piece of garbage. But, you know, when you flip it, he's a baby face and it's, and he's got this sort of very unique charisma to him, kind of like Jeff Hardy does. Mm -hmm. And you can see, like, that's going to be a guy who, um, he might not be smooth in the ring, but there's something to him where it could work in his advantage because he, he's so unique in comparison to everybody else. Um, on the diva side, there's a British talent named Paige, second-generation star, uh, daughter of uh, Sweet Soraya Knight, who has been around forever in the UK scene. And right. was also a Shimmer champion, the women's group in the in, yeah, the, yeah. in the West. And she's like, when a lot of times you see the girls that they hire, um, Kelly Kelly is a good example of this. Mm -hmm. They're models and dainty girls first. And I'm not saying that in a negative way, but right. they don't look like they're fighters. Paige is a cute girl. She's sort of got this uh, Lita-esque charisma to her. Mm -hmm. But when she gets in the ring... So, and it's obviously it's from the British pedigree that she has from growing up around the business. She looks like from her placement of her feet to the physicality of her body when she's hitting the ropes to just getting in the ring and getting ready to lock up. She looks like uh, a female fighter, a female wrestler. Yeah, she's you know, she's, a, she's second generation. So, uh, in fact, there's a documentary that you can find online. I just downloaded it last night, but I haven't watched it. It's called, it's called Wrestling with My Fan or Fighting with My Family. Yeah, that's that's definitely on YouTube, I think. So yeah, yeah. YouTube or Daily Motion, like one of those one of those sites. I, I got it from Daily Motion. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's absolutely an excellent documentary, and it gives mm -hmm. you some insight into the family background. But yeah, right. but you know, it's it's always interesting, you know, with the British talents. And I, I interviewed Doug Williams recently. There's sort of that physicality to them and the way that they move and the way that they wrestle right. that's so different from the Americans or I should say you know, yeah. the, the previous generation of Brit, of Britain, British talents who, and European talents that have been brought up because now a lot of them have come up watching WWE and have learned that style yep. but you know like Paige works similar you know she's kind of similar in the universe to Fit Finlay and, and William Regal than she would be to a Kelly Kelly or a Layla you know, yep. just in the way that she works. And so I'm very curious to see what happens with her, especially because she doesn't look like your your atypical diva. She doesn't have big big enhanced big enhancements, shall we say. Right. There you she go. She doesn't have the teased hair. She doesn't look like, you know, a high end model and very uh, or very, with a very soft look. She looks like a girl like some closer to like what a girl who would fight in MMA would look like. You know, she's not made up to be pretty. She's looking to fight. And there's a whole slew of a roster down there that is so Interesting, and you could. And the one thing I give WWE a lot of credit for is they take a lot of the underutilized main roster guys, your Kurt Hawkins, your Zack Ryder's, mm -hmm. your Antonio Cesaro's, and they're down there in NXT working matches with some of these with, with, with the developmental talents, and in right. some cases doing a program with them. Like Sami Zayn's in the midst of a program with Antonio Cesaro right now, and while I love the the idea of Cesaro with uh, Dutch Mantel. The stuff not in NXT has been far and away a lot more entertaining than any role that they've given Cesaro on the main roster of late. Biggie Langston, another example of that, where he's you know the you know he's kind of doing the, the gimmick in NXT where uh, he wants the five count, kind of like the you know the bad man from Atlantic City, King Kong right. Bugs back in the right, day, right, right. and he's all about the power. And he, I, that's, I, I, a, that's a marked change from the past. They they would never once it was sort of like well the developmental guys are here. The main roster guys are here, and if you're a developmental guy, maybe we'll send you on tour, on on giving you a couple of undercard matches, on house shows, and blah 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 to try to work you in. But 
you never saw programs between the two until now. Yep. I think a part of that has to do with the fact that they were in Florida and yep. so many of their talents are, you know, are, are located in Florida because mm -hmm. a lot of them choose to live in Florida because there's no state income tax, which is pretty smart on their part. Right. And uh, also, you know, so many of them that were when they were signed, they, they, they were they went there and they didn't move. They stayed there. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's worked out. And I, I think a lot of that also has to do with Triple H being so hands on and wanting the tapings to be successful. Right. And what you know what's the best way to draw people make sure you have stars there so that's why you see the Seamus exactly yeah the, the Seamus and the John Cena's and the CM Punk's and the Ric Flair's of the world popping up there and I mean Flair's daughter is in developmental right now his his daughter his daughter Ashley is working under the name very uh, appropriate Charlotte <laughs> that's her name and you know I, I haven't seen much of her in the ring but as a personality you know she definitely has a good personality and you know there's a lot of other talents we haven't even touched upon you know, who, who, you know, some of them are fully formed and ready to go, in my opinion, and others are, are kind of, you know, rough around the edges and finding their way. But that's what NXT should be about. Exactly. It should be about exactly. talents, make, you know, figuring it out and making mistakes. And one of the best assets of their TV is William Regal doing commentary on, mm -hmm. on some of the weeks. Right. And he's so good. And, and uh, you know, I don't think any wrestler since Taz, uh, when he first started doing announcing on SmackDown, Right. He's as good as getting across the mentality of the wrestler and what their strategy would be and why someone would do this and what their placement would be in the ring and things like that. Right, right. And Regal's also very good to point out, well, this one lost because he made a mistake, but that's why he's here, so he can get better and go to the main roster. Mm -hmm. And there, there's a lot of really good wrestling there. And honestly, it is the most underrated wrestling show that you could watch produced by a national television product right now. A couple of NECW alumni down there. That's right. Talk about that. Yeah. The uh, artist formerly known as Max Bauer is in NXT uh, under the name Axel Keegan. I I've only seen one or two of his matches down there. Yeah, he's only popped up on TV a couple of times. Yeah. And, and a girl who uh, only had a couple of matches for us, but I knew the minute I laid eyes on her that she was going to get signed and she was going to do big things is Sasha Banks. Right, and she was the. She's actually. Um, she's in the the, um, the NXT Divas Championship tournament right now, and she's also related to Snoop Dogg, right? Yes, yeah, she is. Her, she is Snoop Dogg's cousin. So it, it, you know, she's got a very unique, exotic look to her. So obviously, that's something WWE looks for. Gorgeous young lady, very athletic young lady, uh, a very good person, and uh, uh, someone that, uh, interestingly enough, there was discussion at one point about. Uh, you know, going all the way with her in our company, and I took one look at her and said, "She's going to be out of here in less than a year." Yeah, it's like Let's um, not go that way, you know. It's, it reminds me. I went to a, an indie show years ago, and uh, this girl comes out to Vina Fly, and she just got in the ring, got on the top rope, did a moonsault into the ring, and I was like, "Holy crap! She's hot. She's fit. She's got a great smile, mm. and she's going to go to WWE one day." And I, I still believe she'll end up there. And yep. that was Rosita from TNA. Wow. Because, like you know, the sec sometimes the second you see them, you, they don't even need to wrestle. Just the way they carry themselves and the way they present themselves and the physicality and, and, and honestly, the attractiveness of them, because wrestling is such a cosmetic business, you right. go, that one's going to go to WWE one day. The first time I saw Matt Stryker, uh, not that I thought he was attractive, not that there's anything wrong if you do, right. um, but I saw him get in the ring on an independent show in New York and his opponent came out and Stryker was the only guy in the ring to kind of, you know, follow his opponent, make sure his opponent wasn't trying to Pearl Harbor him as the guy was making this, you know, coming around the squared circle. And I went, that guy gets it in a way that a lot of indie guys don't. And I knew right then and there, he'd end up somewhere in a national scene at some point because he kind of got it on a level, even that young that others did. And, you know, obviously he went on to be an announcer, but you know, he ended up there and, you know, had an okay run for himself. I'd say. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Tell you what, let's take a break right here. Uh, and when we come back, we'll talk about uh, the independent scene, NECW, some other stuff, and just wrap it all up. So uh, uh, right now, we're going to hear a little bit from one of my favorite features of the PW Insider site, Simonology. Mike Johnson and Simon Dean, Mike Bucci, the artist formerly known as Supernova. We'll be back right after this. The biggest thing was cool for me when I did watch it and at the end of it, I showed my wife it. And I, again, took solace and said to myself, I was part of that. 
and I'm remembered for ECW just as much as not more than being Simon Dean. Uh, I was part of something that'll never be recreated, and I've had I had just as many young guys over the years ask me about what it was like to work at the arena than ever more so than ever did ask me what it was like to wrestle at the Garden, be part of a WrestleMania, anything like that. So, you know, I remember like it was yesterday. It's June nineteenth, that Mike. I remember like it was yesterday. Let's say this weekend was an ECW TV. Going to the arena, pull, taking a Walt Whitman, going over the bridge. I would stop at Wawa before I'd get out of Jersey, pick up my iced tea and my turkey sandwich, pull into the back of the parking lot. And you know me, man. I was one of the more fan-friendly guys. Like, as soon as I pulled up, I used to walk out front, shoot the shit with everybody, hang out. <laughs> and, you know, I had my little corner in the back of the locker room. And, you know, I'd wait for Guido to show, show up and bum some wrist tape off me. And then... uh you know, getting dressed for our afternoon workout, just the smell of the building and having your match and going outside in the summer night back in the park, all that stuff. I mean, I'll never forget that, dude. So uh, the fact that we were part of that can never be duplicated. So that was it was cool for the film to see that. But uh, I, I would definitely be interested in a director's cut, like they said, of adding some more footage and showing some of the guys who necessarily didn't, get destroyed by it mentally and physically. Right. I actually think the, um, and, and this is something a lot of people have had issues with, I actually think, you know, the star of the film is Tony Lewis. Yes. And and some people have been playing... Tony Lewis. I know that. I know. Some people feel like there's too much of a focus on people like him and not enough on bigger names in the, in the company or big angles in the company. They got who they could get. I mean... <laughs> Would they have loved to have gotten Paul Heyman? I'm sure. But, you know, and the Dudleys and Dreamer and all that. But some of the guys didn't want to do it or couldn't do it. Uh, and I always agree with your assessment. We were we grew before our time. Everything pointed to a direction where it should have kept working. But we did do controversial stuff that was stupid. I was there the night that they wanted to hang the Sandman on the cross. I didn't touch that cross. Uh, I was there for Eric Kulas incident. I was there for... You know, a bunch of the other, for the riots and all the others. I mean, I was there for this stuff. So it's stuff you can get away with at the time. You know, can you, can you imagine anything like that ever happening today? No, the, uh, a riot, a riot maybe, but certainly not mass transit and certainly not the, uh, the crucifix, which not in my riot, a riot yeah. couldn't happen today. Not with the way that wrestling shows are set up with, with even the fan, the, the, there's not that much passionate heat and just, I don't know, man. I just don't think the people are, most of the fans aren't invested in the product as much as, because they've been taught, people over the last 10 years have been taught to view wrestling differently. That's true. And what I mean by that, they're keyed in now, who's coming out, let's buy his entrance music, let him hit his pose on the turnbuckle in the middle of the ring for the hard cam, lock up, headlock, shine, cut it off, babe, get some heat, put him in a hole, three elbows, off to the races, all done in six minutes. So your investments in these guys isn't as passionate as it was. I don't know, dude. It's just, it's a different, it could never happen again. I mean, I don't know. It's weird. Let's, uh, let's talk, you know what? We've never talked about some of these crazier incidents and, and your memories of them. We took a lot about WWE stuff. We don't really talk a lot about ECW stuff. What are your memories of that whole scenario surrounding <laughs> the, crucifixion, uh, of the crucifixion of the Sandman, which to me... Um, is still the, the, uh, and people talk about mass transit. To me, I still think the crucifixion angle was the all time worst thing that ever happened in ECW. It was the only time I was ever embarrassed to know that I willingly went to this show. I didn't get it. Like, I didn't know why we were doing it. Like, I, I just, I remember a show, what, what, when you sat, you didn't know about it beforehand, right? No, I was in the, no, I was sitting in the front row at that point. I was still just a fan. So what were you thinking when a cross came out from underneath the ring? <laughs> I was like, what? the hell is that supposed to be like i was like really like like why why are we pulling religion into this what does that have to do with anything i remember before the show (laughs) everybody cut i don't paul i think says that he didn't know about it or something to that degree i just remember before the show right sandman pulling us over to ringside and showing me me and stevie and stuff where it was because he made the cross (laughs) Right. And uh, telling us what we were doing. And I remember him walking away, and I was still green boy at the time. I wasn't going to say no to anything. <laughs> but when push came to shove and we were putting him on that thing, I didn't touch it. I helped hit him and 
hold him on it, but I didn't touch the cross. You know, not to become an ultra religious person, I just thought it was. I didn't realize the offensiveness of it really till afterwards. I just thought it was dumb. You know, I wasn't ever going to question anything that Scotty and those guys are going to do. I just thought it had nothing to do with wrestling. And uh, what I actually thought was even more damning than that in the eyes of the ECW universe was when Raven, when Raven had to go out and apologize afterwards. Yep. I thought that was insane. Here's the most <laughs> – that I remember like it was yesterday. The most evil, diabolical, twisted guy in the company, the hottest gimmick, the Raven gimmick itself. And I, I love Scotty, but I hate Scotty at times, but I love him. Um, the Raven gimmick itself, Johnson, is the most, one of the most influential. I put that up there with the NWO, with the Undertaker, with some of the most revolutionary, awesome, game-changing gimmicks that had been around over the last, shit, man, I'd say 30 or 40 years. Yeah, I wouldn't argue that. Raven in his prime. Fuck. Was I mean, a vibrant character that, dude, unlike anything else, <laughs> with angst and argument against the man and the people and how his inner turmoil and all that stuff, and it just took a whole generation of kids thinking and said, "Yeah, this guy's cool, man." And I just remember us doing it, and him having to apologize. I just remember it was like finding out there was no Santa Claus. I really do. And uh, I was like, "Oh my god!" I mean, I'm not gonna, dude. A part of Scotty's mythos. And his character and his legend died when he went out there and did that that day. He knows it, too. He'll probably never admit it, but or maybe he has admitted it, but he, he certainly did not want to do that apology either. Oh, no, he didn't. Yeah. Do you, I mean, do you remember any of that? Were you, were you around for any of that discussion in the back? Like, do you remember what the reaction was when you guys took Sandman to the back? <laughs> no, I remember, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm a deer-eyed kid sitting in the hot t- headlights right there at that point. I'm, I'm like, wow. You know, I don't remember the anybody flipping out or anything, but I just remember probably everybody sitting around stunned. And then I remember Kurt Angle flipping out about it. And uh, I just remember saying, shit, we got an Olympic gold medalist here flipping out about this. This isn't good. And then they pulled Scotty aside and everybody talked to him. And later on in the show, he came out and apologized. But, uh, and it was a half-assed apology too. Like he, you could tell he didn't want to do it. Yeah. In his mind, he was like, well, this is bullshit. I'm a heat. I'm a heel who's trying to get heat, but I'm out here fucking apologizing for this. I, at that point, we had already done it. I didn't understand the apology point out of it. I mean, because if you're going to get any heat for it, what are you going to do? Show the people who gave us heat? Oh, by the way, he apologized for it. If there was going to be any apology that night, it should have been from Heyman, because he was always the voice when something yeah. went wrong. It wasn't fair to do it to Scott. <laughs> to it was one, that was one of the worst things I ever saw a talent have to do, was go out there and apologize for his actions as a pro wrestling character. You know, I, I didn't run the company. I, I wasn't you know, part of all that, but they, they did it. It was just uh, one of that. You're listening to PW Insider Radio. Welcome back to PW Insider Radio. Sheldon Goldberg and Mike Johnson, good to be with you. And thank you, by the way, for listening to this podcast. We really appreciate it, and uh, we hope that you'll take the time to support PW Insider, become a member of the site. It's a great deal. You're going to get tons and tons of awesome content, and we're just giving you the tip of the iceberg right here. So, uh, Mike, give me a, a little quick rundown of some of the great things that are up on the PW Insider site right now. Well, we do a number of interviews a week of late, we, and we see, you've heard some clips of them. We've had interviews with Douglas Williams from TNA, the former Derek Bateman from WWE. We're going to have Jim Cornette on very soon. Uh, Simon Dean comes on on a regular basis to do Simonology. Former WWF star Jim Powers comes on on a regular basis to kind of talk about stories from the road. Um, we've had uh, Les Thatcher, famous wrestling trainer and announcer and uh, performer from everywhere from the Mid-Atlantic Territory all the way to actually having a WWE developmental system at one point of his mm-hmm. own. And the promotion right. HWA does a regular feature. and But not only, you know, we have tons of different personalities from WWE level uh, performers all the way down to independent stars, bookers, authors, historians, all sorts of personalities on the site for interviews. And beyond that, we do regular hot news hotlines, breaking news, uh, in-depth stories that are just happening in the world of WWE, TNA, Ring of Honor, and the, the, the surrounding universe that is pro wrestling. Um, and of course, you know we've, we do interactive mailbags where subscribers ask myself, Dave Scherer, Mike Epson Hart, Stu Carapola, 
questions and opinions, not just on wrestling, but also on pop culture and life. And that leads into our different mailbags. And of course we have a lot of off, uh, off, off, off key, off color, very unique content with a lot of all of uh, those things. Those, those, all of those, things. all of those adjectives work. Yeah. It's, <laughs> if, if, if you like, uh, personalities that are very strong, who are going to argue and debate their points in your discussion of pro wrestling and also have some fun with each other. Uh, it's a very unique sort of Manson family crew, I guess. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and we, we, you've got sort of that fun wackiness as well. And, of course, we do post-game shows for every major WWE, TNA mm-hmm. uh, broadcast. And, you know, wh- whether Raw, SmackDown, NXT, all the pay-per-views. So there's an immediate discussion within, if not that night, but by early the next day about the show, its merits, its... It's critical points, whether it was fun, whether it was not. Um, and with pay-per-views, those go up right away. So if you didn't see the show live and you need an idea of whether the show is good or not, whether you want to spend your hard-earned money and order the replay, mm-hmm. you get all that, plus tons of writing and, uh, you know, it, it, all ad-free. Obviously, if you're listening to this on the free side of PWInsider.com, you can see there's a lot of ads. The elite side, completely 100% ad-free, no blinking ads, no no banners, no boxes, no nothing. It's just nothing but content. And it exists on its own self-supported server, so it's a lot faster than the free site, and it's on its own uh, domain. So you can check out uh, PWInsiderElite.com and uh, subscribe, and we hope you do. Yeah, and great experience. The best part Highly is, recommended. Yep. the best part, I didn't tell you the best part, you can try the site out for three days free without having to give us a dime. So you can check it out, wow. sample it, and then decide, I want to stick around with these guys. They're awesome. Or oh. you could move on, and hopefully we'll win you back down the line. All right. Well, but you I want to ask you to at least check it out. So but I want to ask you a question. Yeah. One of the reasons we haven't had a chance to do this as, as often as we want mm-hmm. is you and your company, New England Championship Wrestling, dove back into uh, television again. And you're on weekly on broadcast TV. In yeah. uh, the New England area, in Boston specifically, right. um, you know, I wanted to see what that what that experience is like for you, and take us through the mind of a of a promoter trying to take his company to the next level and expose it uh, with television, which in a bad case, in a bad scenario, could end up being the death of a promotion. Well, uh, it's not going to be the death of, of, of our promotion uh, only because we were able to make a deal that. Uh, that uh, we could uh, we could very easily live with, and 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 the reason for that is, um, this station uh, for the most part has been pretty much a box in the, in this market. When I say that, what I mean is, it was basically infomercials. They they were running a network called Plum TV, which was a lifestyle network that went out of business. They've replaced it now with Cozy TV, which is owned by NBC. Actually, it's uh, mostly classic TV and reruns with some original programming and movies and so forth. And, uh, uh, but, um, it's not a station that, uh, uh, has any programming department or produces any original programming. There's no local news on it or anything of that nature. So it's, it's not, uh, what you would call a major force in the market. But the interesting thing about the station is it's owned by the same company that owns KDOC in Los Angeles. Now, K- KDOC in Los Angeles is the home of Championship Wrestling from Hollywood. The uh, Dave Marquez owned, promotion. Yes, owned by my very good friend Dave Marquez, who uh, is also the production director for that station. And uh, it was Dave opening the door that, that uh, allowed us to walk through and, uh, and get on there. It's not the first time they've had local wrestling on the station, but uh, uh, once we were on... We signed a 13-week deal, and by the second week, they said, "Up, oh, you can stay on as long as you want. We'll just uh, we can extend your contract through the end of the year at least, so you're good." Um, so we were very, very happy about that. Um, a lot of challenges with this. Uh, you know, when NECW was on TV in 2010, originally it was an hour-long show, and to in the end, we did that for about six months, and then we reverted to a half hour. Doing a half hour is a challenge. It's a challenge for a lot of reasons. This show, unlike the Comcast On Demand show of 2010, does have paid advertising in it. We do have sponsors. So it's not like we have uh, you know, uh, 2830 wall-to-wall of, of just 
content. We have to make room for uh, some commercials, some some sponsorships that we have sold, and so forth. And uh, it, it, to put it in in greater perspective for you, um, think of it versus Raw, just in terms of time. Our show is. 30 minutes, 28 minutes and 30 seconds, actually, when you take out time for station breaks and so forth, versus Raw, which is three hours. So that, so one edition of NECW equals, uh, uh, rather, uh, one edition of Raw equals six editions of NECW. So it, it's trying to get a lot of things over in a shorter period of time is a challenge, but a fun one in our case. Brian Nadeau, who is the uh, producer-director of our television, um, he and I put the TVs together. We, we've had a, a very good working relationship for years now um, that really, really developed and bonded through the process of doing television in 2010. So we're always doing little tweaks. The format isn't always the same from one week to the next. There's always little tweaks to it. We get a chance to experiment a little bit, but uh, we also get a chance to, to do the stuff that we really want to do. And uh, uh, it, it's been a very, very interesting experience. This, by the way, is the first time in the 12-plus the, uh, year history of New England Championship Wrestling, which celebrates its 13th anniversary uh, in August, by the way, uh, that I have actually booked the company. You've what? Uh, th this is the first. I'll, start, I'll do that again so I can edit it. This is the first time in the 12 and a half year history of, of the company. Actually, we celebrate our 13th anniversary officially in September. The actual uh, anniversary is in August. But this is the first time that I've actually booked the company as well as uh, as well as been the promoter. So, so you're like Vince. You've gone power mad. I don't know about power mad. I just work cheap. That's, uh, <laughs> and, you know, I think in, in past incarnations of NECW, there's always been – uh, uh, someone else who was the booker or who was doing the matchmaking or I had entrusted with the creative direction of the company and I've just grown to the point where uh, it's time to take that out of the equation and to put my hands completely on the wheel and run the thing myself and if it goes into a ditch then it's all my fault and if it uh, breaks through barriers and becomes a big success, well, you know, I'll, I'll give everybody else the credit for that. So uh, so there you go. But it's been an interesting challenge, a fun one. Frustrating at times, but uh, very, very rewarding. As I, I was saying at the top of the show, um, the feedback that I've gotten has been really, really heartwarming. Uh, a lot of people really, really enjoying the television that we're doing. And uh, one of the things that, that makes the show a little bit different is that we take time doing things, and in a half-hour format, that means that sometimes, uh, you know, you don't see a lot of certain people or whatever. It just takes time, but uh, there's definitely a focus on storytelling, definitely a focus on on good matches and good talent, and uh, things sort of develop a little bit slowly. In in fact, uh, in the coming weeks, uh, in the previous weeks, I should say, we've spent a lot of time developing the undercard showing you who's who and what's what and who's feuding with who and who the champions are and who their top challengers are and so forth. In the next couple of weeks, when the first 13 weeks of, of, of this program comes to a finish, the, the top part of the card will come into focus and you'll see uh, that how we have built up to what the main feud is going to be and how that main feud is going to affect a lot of things underneath it. So it's been an interesting exercise in storytelling. It's an interesting exercise in seeing talent get a chance to really express themselves and, and show what they can do in the theater of television. Uh, and I think that the guy who's going to be the biggest beneficiary of that, Mike, is the NECW heavyweight champion, the current one, and that's Antonio Thomas. And that's someone with a former uh, WWE pedigree right there. That's right. That's right. I think t Antonio Thomas is a guy who should have been a much bigger star in this business. And I think part of the reason that he hasn't um, is that he's never really had a, an opportunity. He's never really had the stage to, to show what he can do on his own. His WWE run was as part of a tag team, uh, the Heartthrobs. 
and and they were a great team, and, and, and they did a lot of interesting things. They were a big hit in OVW that didn't quite translate onto the main roster, but that's a story that's better told by them. Uh, but I always thought Antonio Thomas started in NECW as a single, and uh, although he did uh, was formerly one half of the NECW Tag Team Champions at one point, but I think that uh, Antonio Thomas uh, is a guy who should have been a, a very big single star, and hopefully uh, when his run in this company is done, and I hope that's not for quite a long time, that people will see him in a different light as we attempt to cast him in a different light. So uh, it's something to look forward to. There's a lot of great talents on this show. I think uh, Sean Burke um, is someone who is a can't-miss superstar. Uh, Johnny Thunder, a veteran, has been doing some, some very great and interesting things. Jeremy Prophet from Canada uh, is, uh, I think, a can't-miss superstar. Uh, Slick Wagner Brown is a guy who, who never really had his day. Great, great athlete, great performer. Uh, I think uh, Wagner at this time in his life is older and wiser and a, a much better and more well-rounded performer than he has been at any time in his career. And he's getting a chance in the context of what we're doing in New England Championship Wrestling to show that. So uh, a, a lot of great things uh, to see on New England Championship Wrestling, and hopefully everyone checks it out. If you don't live in the Boston area and you want to see it, uh, our YouTube channel has every single show. They are put up almost immediately after they air. So if you go to youtube.com slash NECW Wrestling, you'll be able to see all that content. Plus, we have a, a great web series up there called The Best of World Women's Wrestling, which is highlights of, of some of the great women's matches that we've had over the years uh, in sort of a semi-documentary style, which, uh, uh, which we've gotten a lot of great compliments on. So... Lots to check out there. Keeps me busy. Keeps me off the streets. Keeps you from doing podcasts. That's right. That too. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna fix that though. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm gonna lock you in a corner and not let you out. Oh, but uh, right. yeah, and, I mean, Get it's line. Been a, Take a number. You know. <laughs> it's, been, <laughs> it's been a it's been a it's been a fun couple of weeks watching the show and watching it progress and uh, you know um, hopefully it's gonna add to the bottom line of NECW as an entity and you know Take be time. You know, I, when I got into this, I had no illusions about that. It's on in fringe time. It airs at 12.30 in the morning on Thursdays. So it's Thursday night, Friday morning. And whenever you're on in fringe time, it, it takes time for the audience to find you. And uh, I, I kind of knew that going in, which is why we kind of did things sort of in the reverse of how you might think they would normally be done. Normally, you would establish your main event first and work down. But knowing that it would take time to build it up, we did it the opposite way. We started with, uh, you know, you get a chance to know what the company is and who the champions are and so forth. And we kind of introduce you to the undercard and who's here and who's doing what. And this guy's after this title. This one's after that title. And, and kind of giving you a foundation for what's going to happen on top. So uh, uh, we're finally reaching the point and at the end of this 13 weeks. This is uh, week 12 that's going to be airing tonight as we tape this. Uh, the, the top part of the card is going to really come into focus and we're going to be off to the races from there. So, uh, it, it, as I say, I am just so very grateful for this opportunity to be able to, to do this again. And, uh, I, I walk around most days with a very big smile on my face that, uh, uh that, uh, this company didn't just dry up and disappear. We, we didn't quit, came back and, uh, now we're back bigger and uh, hopefully better than ever. I know how you feel because I'm I'm very blessed to be doing what I do. And, I mean, I get to work every day with David Scherer and the rest of the crew at PW Insider. And I love my I love my job, hmm. <laughs> probably to my own detriment. I love yeah. my job. You know, I haven't spoken to Dave Scherer in, in, in quite a few years. So, Dave, if you're listening to this, and I know you will be, uh, you are often in my thoughts. Hope all is well with you. And, we should catch up by phone one of these days real soon. Oh, we'll have to get him on this. Well, I'm sure he'll be popping up on this. It's yeah, like, yeah. I look forward to that. But you know, and, and that's you know that's the thing. You know, with PW Insider, you know, we're not just a bunch of guys writing about wrestling. We're also uh, a family of friends who, yeah, you know, good or bad, we you know we all have our nuances and our and our and our quirks, and uh, you know that is sort of explored on the site as well, where you kind of get to know us as personalities as much as, 
you get to know about us writing about the business. And I think that's the thing that kind of sets us apart from everybody else is that we're not kind of looking at wrestling from this sort of um, uh, window where we're on the outside and they're on the inside. And we're kind of looking at them from this very sanitized, snooty sort of point of view. You know, we under yeah. it, it, the wrestling business is meant to be fun. It's meant to be an escape for people who care about it on whatever level they care about it. And we try to be the same. We want to have fun with the site and we want people to be entertained and we want to be the reason that they are entertained. And we want to make sure that we earn far more than the money or the time that they're putting into the site themselves, either through subscribing or visiting the site or whatever. So, you know, and it, it's been a blast. I mean, I, I, the idea that we're going to hit our 10 year anniversary this come January, wow. this coming January is like, Mind blowing and very humbling, and uh, I, you know everybody out there who's ever listened to us or supported us or paid for a subscription, we cannot thank you enough. And for those of you who haven't uh, been subscribers, hopefully you'll get a chance to check it out full time. And if you like this audio, there's a lot more where that came from on the site. Mm -hmm. All right, well you know it's something you must check out. So pwinsiderelite.com, subscribe to the site. You won't regret it. Try it out for three days. You won't even have to pay for it. Try yeah. it out for three days. Just do that for me. Try it for three days, and I guarantee you, you're going to get it. You don't get to test drive a car for three days. That's right. You're going to hang out with us for three days. That's right. There you go. All right. Well, let's wrap it up right here. Uh, it's been good to, to, to do this with you again. I, I really missed it. It has been, and well, let's do it again as soon as we can. And that. by soon, I mean tomorrow. All right, there you go. <laughs> all right, well, uh, for Mike Johnson and myself, Sheldon Goldberg, thank you all for listening. Thank you for support. We'll see you next time on PW Insider Radio. Don't forget to check out the site.